Peterson? Here. Mr. Swingle? Here. Ms. Tilly? Here. Thank you. Councilman Dean will uh, tie up with some work issues down in San Francisco and probably will not be here tonight. Uh, the first item on our agenda is County Economic Development Update. We have with us Mark Salat, who is the County Economic Development Director. He's been on the job for a year, yeah, had in a few days maybe, and has been making the rounds around the county, uh, getting to know people, getting to know the municipal issues, and also formulating plans to implement uh, what we refer to as says and uh, what we call it now, I should know it, but uh, anyway, uh, here with an update on how that work is coming along with Mark Sally. Welcome and come on up. Uh, so we have people scattered uh, to do your best to talk out so we can all hear. If you need a mic, you can have it, uh, otherwise we'll try to hear it. I never needed a mic ever, so unless I'm pretty sure no one, if anything, people hear me too much, but uh, if uh, there is any issues, just let me know. Um, maybe the best place for me to do it is right from here. Um, I got here a little early and put that up in the best way I can anticipate the, the room setting up, but uh, if there's any questions about what's up there, please let me know. I know it's a small screen for the room. But uh, thank you very much for the time. I asked the mayor if I could come back before the, uh, the committee tonight because I really haven't been in front of you all, or the, or the, or the public in front of since my introduction just about a year ago. And, and the mayor's right, it did pass being on the job uh, a year, about a week or so ago. And even though I've been working with Mayor Greiner as part of the County Planning Committee and with Councilman Swingle as part of the Planning Committee Partnership and getting feedback on what you're going to see here today from your businesses and people and organizations, etc., I had not formally been before this board since then. So I appreciate the chance to come back and tell you how we're rolling the Economic Development Initiative forward. And, and that's what we're I'm calling it, uh, Mayor, at this point. We're kind of, we kind of use the term says dead at this point. Not that the actions or recommendations in it are dead, but just that terminology because Nobody outside of here really knows what that is, but they, they do recognize that kind of development. So, so yeah. can you possibly turn that because this is being recorded. Council members can turn their chairs, we can't. Oh, okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much. much. It's going to. Well, can I drive on there? Yep. Yeah, I was about to say, it might be a little bit of a problem with the way the screen is standing. Yeah, yeah well, we'll 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 for a minute. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to set up okay. Yeah. I'll probably move back. We're going to go to the other side. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. So, short presentation uh, tonight, so I won't go into detail on everything we're doing, but basically, these are the standard economic development building blocks that a lot of people are familiar with. We won't talk about all of these tonight, so, for example, workforce development might not be a big part of the topic, or business attraction. All these things are going on and much, much, much more. Uh, in extensive detail that I could probably talk about for three or four hours. By the way, any show of hands used in favor of hearing that version? <laughs> Mayor, I've never had a positive on that one yet. So. <laughs> but tonight what I'd like to talk about is just the transformative part of what we're trying to get done through this economic development initiative. And getting back to that sense document, when I got here, that was the primary conversation about economic development at that point. That was the document that recommended creation of an economic development division and hiring an economic development director. And there are a lot of challenges pointed out in that document in situations that Hunter Den, uh, according to the document, had to deal with to be sustainable long term. To be honest with you, you can really narrow them down to what you see here. Uh, what this initiative tries to do is attack this in terms of aging population and declining population, both of which have happened rapidly in recent years. And if you look at the New Jersey Department of Labor, Labor projections for 2030, the numbers get very, very bleak if nothing is done in terms of trying to sustain. 
So we're focusing here, and everything kind of ties back to this, because if we don't do something about these two, it doesn't really matter what else we do. And one of the things that was pointed out that was driving these factors is the fact that we have primarily seen lower wage job creation in recent years. Uh, the Merck's are gone, there's more restaurants and so on and so forth, and there's nothing wrong with that part of it, uh, but the kind of jobs that would enable young folks to stay here or come here and buy a home and support a family, those jobs were not as plentiful as they once were. We'll talk about lack of brand and vanity a little bit later, but that's an important part of this too. So, what we wanted to do is go ahead and put together an initial program focus that, that focused on creating those high-wage jobs, but in areas that have a low impact and small footprint. Because if you look at what's reasonable and appropriate growth for Hunter County, let's just say that chemical manufacturing had the highest wages uh, for graduates within the country. I don't think that many of us would consider uh, economic development initiative based on growing the chemical manufacturing industry reasonable and appropriate growth for Hunter. Uh, so again, we're looking for those high wages, but they've got to be, they've got to be, um, I'm sorry? Uh, it's not that there can't be a component of that, but there is not a lot of public and political uh, will for very large footprint projects like that in Hunter Day, there's not the infrastructure or the land availability in a lot of the areas to uh, build a strategy around something like that, or you know, other kinds of manufacturing, like large assembly plants, what have you, it wouldn't be the uh, infrastructure to support it. You know that there are three large chemical manufacturing companies in the county that I know of. I am aware of that. That employ very high wage employees. There's something here that attracted me. Something here that attracted me. That's what I know. Again, what we're going to talk about today isn't the exclusion of everything else. What I'm trying to talk about is a way that we're moving this model forward that can be transformative, but it's not that everything else gets it. Uh, so, for example, those companies, if we, we would make every effort to retain and help them expand where a partnership like that was available, if a chemical manufacturing opportunity came up and the community was interested in having that, I'm not going to decide for that community that we're not going to pursue that, but that's not a model that I'm walking around talking about as the way we're planning a long-term future. That's all, but I'm not discounting that. And that really was just an example to make my point. So. But we can talk about that in more detail. Uh, I'm going to leave my cards here uh, afterwards. So the bottom line, when you take into account open space and the Highlands Act and uh, some of the other limitations we talked about, we really want to arrive at an industry that focuses, uh, that really fits a lot of this area. And you know what I'm about to say from hearing from the Fleming Community Partnership. Uh, we're really targeting clean and niche technology, IT, R&D, bio and life science, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, sort of an example of this is a company called Integrated Clinical Systems that's on Route 12 in Kingwood Township. That is a company that writes software for the pharmaceutical industry. They have very high-end clients, so they've got a beautiful retreat-like facility that's totally self-sustaining. Any one of our 26 communities would be proud to have that company. They uh, have a very light impact. They don't generate a lot of traffic. And yet, the careers in there are very much in line with what are growing industries in New Jersey and, and sustainable industries in New Jersey. And the average wage in that uh, company is well, well, well worth of six figures. Now that is the kind of development that almost every community within the county can get behind. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that's an open conversation. And again, this is only a year old, it doesn't mean it won't gravitate towards anything, everything, anything else. But this approach is creating a commonality in the way we talk about it development around the county and getting a lot of folks on board moving something forward. So here's just a little thing that backs that up. Uh, this is the close, there's 100 basically clusters, biggest clusters of uh, advanced industry uh, jobs within the country and the closest one to us is Allentown, Bethlehem, East and of course right across the river. And you can kind of see right here the average wage across all jobs in that cluster is 46320 The average annual earnings for the workers in what their advanced industries are over there is almost 70000 
So that's a 50% increase. And uh, again, as you heard from uh, Judy when she was here talking about the uh, Fleming Community Partnership, Judy started just a month and a half after I did. And I met with her immediately and talked about this being sort of an initial vision that was coming together. And uh, FCP was right behind that. And um, the Chamber is as well. And basically what we've got going at this point is an innovation, innovation initiative with those three entities. So the goal of everything, regardless of what industry the jobs come from, is to make sure we stop educating students for export purposes only. We want to create, bring back more of those jobs that will allow our folks to stay here and grow a family, buy your homes, contribute to the local economy, and most importantly, repopulate the school district. So it's really an opportunity-based initiative, not necessarily a bricks and mortar-based initiative. And we sort of, sort of had initially a three-pronged approach to addressing this issue. And by the way, this is probably the last time this particular presentation is going to be given because so much has evolved so quickly working with communities and organizations over the last three or four months that we really are branching out into a lot of new areas. But the initial conversation revolved around working with municipalities, having an initial conversation that said, can we create some targeted industrial growth zones where it is easier for the kind of companies that you would like to see be able to come here and get set up. So basically, it's more of a turnkey process. So if a community has already decided they want an IT company, can we go ahead and make it cheaper and quicker and easier for an IT company to get set up? What's reasonable and appropriate to explore in that area? So if I'm out of the tech trade show in the Midwest, and the next Google is interested in coming to Flemington or anywhere else, I'm able to say at that point, hey, not only do we have an educated workforce that's going to support your growth, not only do we have a great location selected for you, we've got a community that's already decided you are what they want, and they have a series of uh, steps they put in place to be able to partner with you. And that really becomes a great success. Uh, that really becomes a great uh, way to set uh, at that point, and it lets us stand out above the competition, especially the New Jersey competition, because as most of us know, New Jersey has a very, very bad reputation for dealing with business around the nation. So that becomes something that's powerful. There's six or seven communities that are having this conversation with us right now, including a little mini partnership we formed with two other, the, two, the county is formed with two communities that are exploring how to maybe put together a best tool, best practices, or sort of a basic toolkit to address these things so that other communities, if interested, but aren't, aren't necessarily having wanting to put in the time to be a part of it, we can kind of roll it out to them and they can adopt it as they see fit or, or not. Uh, obviously, I um, had some kind of conversation about this kind of thing through my work with FCP, not necessarily with this group, but if anybody wants to, uh, obviously I welcome the chance to have the conversation about what this may or may not look like you know, for Fleming here, the way it would be beneficial. So the next, um, whoops, backwards. The next piece is education, and uh, want to go ahead and work with the schools to make sure that the career that the students are being exposed uh, and, uh, and, and a lot of right, being exposed to the kind of career pathways that exist within the industries we're trying to grow and the industries that are strong and generate high wages in New Jersey in general. And Casey, let me give you a little example. Uh, the Exxon R&D facility, which is a perfect representation in some ways of, of what we're talking about here, up in Clinton Township, is expanding. There's 462 laboratories in that facility with all kinds of jobs that would be great for our graduates. But the North 140s uh, administration had never been out there before uh, to have that conversation with them. Uh, they got a new superintendent, so that wasn't certainly, certainly wasn't on him, but he has the same kind of thoughts that FCP and we have. Uh, so anyway, recently we went ahead and went out there to start having a conversation about what could be done to basically align some of these uh, uh, career paths with what's happening at Exxon. So if students do get interested in these areas, maybe they can establish a relationship with Exxon, some kind of connection with them, go off to school and have the ability to come back and start working with them right away. There's a lot of pieces of this, again, for time's sake, we won't get into them, but the superintendents have been quite excited about having this conversation. Most of this stuff, is particularly on the education side, is in its infancy, and most of the work we're doing right now in this area is specifically the North Carolina uh, 40s, but I am meeting with the 100 Central Superintendent for the first time next week to start having a dialogue. 
The next piece is the one that's kind of the most exciting to a lot of people, and that's the entrepreneurial side of things. And what this is right here is we want to make sure that anyone that has a good idea anywhere in Huntington County knows that they can grow their idea right here. They do not have to go somewhere else. We want to make sure we're engaging that community to make sure that if all the entrepreneurs and the innovators stay here and create jobs here. And one of the reasons for that is that right now that community is not engaged with itself at all. We'll talk about that in a minute. But basically this looks like a lot of things. It can look like a business incubator. Again, a space where businesses can get off the ground cheaper and easier. So just like up here, where they're relocating here and have a little bit more of a turnkey process. This does the same thing for startup opportunities. So the incubators can be paired with angel investors and mentor networks and maybe some loan programs, share office spaces, business advisory committees, and so on and so forth. And so, let me jump ahead here for a second. Uh, this is the event that I know uh, FCP talked about a couple weeks ago. The hackathon embodies what I just talked about for a lot of reasons in terms of the entrepreneurial side. Yes, ma'am. FCP, Flemington Community Partnership. My apologies. It just gets me a mouthful after a while, so I figured I'd start abbreviating. I don't do that when I'm in the other communities, but I figured by here, I'd take advantage of that. Um, by the way, no matter where I go, it's really interesting, whether it's Reddington or High Bridge, people are really excited that Huntington is, is embracing this stuff like It's just an overwhelmingly positive response to it. Um, but the hackathon, here's why the hackathon is so uh, important, and getting back to that whole entrepreneurial piece of partnering with the Reddingers. And if you don't know what a hackathon is, don't feel bad, because when I started on a job last year, it originally came for you guys, and I didn't know what it was either. But essentially what it is, is 24 hour event where technologists come together to move, find a team to move their ideas forward uh, or solve other problems that uh, participants show up with. And they do this for the chance to pitch these ideas for prizes and potential investment. And so we are having our uh, first hack Day. First 100 Day uh, Hackathon is on April 28, 29. This is a full partnership between Fleming Community Partnership, 100 Day County, and the 100 Day County Chamber of Commerce. And the value of this event is threefold. First of all, the hackathon, through the events that are leading up to it, the partnership that's coming out of it, is engaging that community with itself. And that really hasn't happened before. So what, what's happening prior to this is, if somebody is sitting in their home office with an idea for an app, for example, that's going to become the next Facebook, they don't know where to go to build their team. They may leave and think they've got to go to Hoboken or to Morristown to build that team. So what's happening through this effort and the meetups and things like that that are, that are, that are uh, bringing this community together in preparation for the hackathon is that these folks are finding each other and they're realizing that they have a technology idea, they can move forward with the talent that exists around them here. And this all gets back to a point that was told to us early on when we talked to technologists in Northern Philadelphia and they said, why won't this concept work in Hunter? And inevitably, they would tell us, you're only going to have so much of an ability to attract the kind of workforce you need here to support this, these kind of industries. So you darn well better know what you've already got. So the hackathon is basically doing just that, and it's engaging that community with each other. Secondly, though, it's engaging this community with us, so that if we put together a tech attraction committee, it's not God forbid, just myself and Mayor Biner and three over the day trying to scheme up the ideas of how to do that. We've got the actual technology community helping us do that. So we want to also be able to engage them in our efforts, and believe me, they are excited about that. Last two hackathons I've gone to, or last two meetups I've gone to, um, that has uh, been addressed, uh, that's been gathering these folks together at uh, Long Eagle Brewing. I tried, I, both times I tried to leave, and it took an hour and a half to leave each time. Because these folks were basically lined up like it was a reception at a wedding, wanting to share their ideas. I'm sure you experienced that, Brian, as well. And just from going to one session, I could have put a 10 year plan together on how to grow a technology initiative. So that's exciting. And the third piece to this is that it starts to, this connection starts to give us an idea of what our market looks like. 
for business indicators and things like that. So we're really getting a sense of core innovators here, and it's a pretty exciting opportunity. Now there's just an example of one of the um, uh, uh, promotion flyers. Here's the Hack 101 Kimita. And uh, by the way, all of this in the in innovation initiative is getting us set to deal with this because a lot of folks say millennials will not come to these communities, innovators will not come to these communities, but there's indication in the press and in research that that's not the case. This was a recent article talking about just that. Millennial innovators are about to leave big cities. So whether we keep them from going there in the first place or bring them out, we want to be ready for it. Sorry, what was the source? You know, good question, but I cut that off on this. I feel like this was a USA Today article, but I can't remember now. So what is this commentary? I had a few of these things. Commentary versus article. What did I not start? Yeah, the commentary versus article. I just want to make that decision. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I could find some articles that say there's some research documents, but correct. This, I mean, this is not a good example of, of what I just think in every mind. This one is more of a commentary. Uh, I really just grabbed it from the headline. It threw perfectly. So, uh, so that's to back up for a second. Just to reinforce one thing, this is the part I skipped over. Just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that this initiative, what you're seeing here, is moving forward uh, and is being built by immersion in the community. So when I first met with you all last year, you were one of my first stops at the gate, but I met extensively with 24 to 26 communities in Hunter and Out, and that kind of feedback has been part of building this effort. And the relationships with this initiative have grown to the point that we've really got work plans for this year with and different communities. And they're not formal documents. This is the one that I gave the mayor earlier this year. And basically, this initial one, since this was the first year, we haven't gone very far down the road together outside of that hackathon. Um, this basically just creates an accountability in me to you. So that we go to get the website off the ground, I make sure I'm talking with you all, making sure your properties are represented well on the property locator. Uh, if we start the branding effort, we make sure we get some feedback uh, from some of the leaders here and so on and so forth. So not a lot of detail on this, it wasn't necessarily an official document, but it was a starter document. And the nice thing is that we were able to have this for 10 different communities right out of the gate. Uh, so it, again, everything being built with a lot of partnership. It's a little blurry, but Toward the bottom, does it say market loading sites and buildings? Yes, and what, that is uh, what I just mentioned here in terms of getting our property located together on the website. Oh, yeah. um, and um, gonna, and uh, one of the ones at the bottom is, and I, I've been doing this with uh, SCP, I'd like to have a minimum of three joint visits with um, planning and leadership this year. And this is in all of the community's plans. Because what we want to do is we want to make sure we're sending the message to our business community that there's a joint county, local, municipality effort to partner with them to make sure that they can succeed here. We do not want to keep losing ratings, obviously. So even if we don't attract new business, even if the goal isn't to attract an overwhelming amount of new business, we certainly want to grow some, like we just talked about, and we don't want to re-lose what we already have. So, you go out and you visit a, a company, a lot of things happen. I'll give you another example. There's a company that I went to recently in Kingwood Township, Zero Search, and they're sponsors for the hackathon. Had an initial visit there just to say hi and see what they did. And it turned out they had a couple of uh, minor issues that uh, were really just communication problems between them and Kingwood uh, Township. Very solvable issues that they just didn't quite know how to go about getting past them and moving on. So it came back. Uh, uh, a week later with the deputy mayor, Richard Dodds. Richard solved all the problems right there on the spot, opened up a line of communication with the company that would save them trouble in the future. The company was very happy. Town got a chance to learn more about one of their companies. And so we solved problems and we sent a message about partnering with them. But this has tremendous results in terms of growing the rest of our efforts. This company was so excited they immediately became sponsors of the hackathon. They've been integral partners in helping build our audience and our reach for the hackathon. They're excited about participating in a lot of other events. And they've even got some proposed that would help uh, address some of the challenges that were laid out in the initial set. So when we go out to send this message to the business community, we're not just doing it for their sake. We're, no, we're not just doing it to save available. We're building a team. And those companies became become engaged in helping us solve our problems as well. And so it has a it has a great result when you do that kind of joint visitation. 
So I'll jump over that because I talked about it. I do want to talk about one other piece of the entrepreneurial initiative, and that's the incubator. That's another thing that is a joint Fleming Community Partnership Chamber of Commerce, Monday County effort, where we're looking at the feasibility of establishing a business incubator or a series of business incubators, depending on what the market dictates. And we hopefully soon will go about putting together a uh, feasibility study for one. This is another one of the things that people say cannot work in rural America. And I have found plenty of examples where they have. One of the most uh, successful incubator slash accelerators in the country is a place called Red Wing, Minnesota. And I don't know a whole lot about Red Wing, Minnesota. I know it's a lot smaller than us. And I know that there's absolutely no way that Hunterman County, New Jersey is not more marketable than Red Wing, Minnesota. So that's a great example. And here's another one. Franklin and Southampton counties have a joint incubator together. And I put their Wikipedia entries right here. One has about 18,000 people. One has about 56,000 people. So together, they're not even close to the size of one county. And there's a lot of novelty good in the measuring impact study that came out up with recently on their incubator. The part that matters is this. They have had 18 successful businesses, 18 spin out from their incubator. And, of course, the whole point of them is to keep them. Eleven of those stayed within the region and became major job generators. One of them uh, actually grew with staff of 64. So, again, a much more rural community with a much less educated population that had stunning results and local impact from their incubator. So, moving on. Mark, what does the community do to support that? What? I'm sorry, what's that? What specifically did the community do? Yeah, uh, in their case, it's been so long since I looked at that, I wouldn't want to misrepresent what I read it. Well, I think that's an extremely important question. Absolutely. Because this is funny to be All right? This is higher than how you do. Both those entities, in my opinion, are extremely business friendly. And I don't want to get into any of the other problems, but those problems have to be identified and resolved. Before I can see this coming. Well, you're, you're no question that that's our reputation. I, I will say there's already been a lot of examples of us being able to begin very slowly to change that in some people's minds. It's going it's to so take bad. a long time. It's so bad in this town that they don't even do business for a local business owner in this town. That's there is, but keep in mind. While we're working on that, it's not like this incubator is coming out tomorrow. Again, what you said about studying the factors that led to success in other communities, that's all going to be a part of the feasibility study. Keep in mind that all of this has been put together in just one year. This is the way we're approaching economic development. Right now, there's a lot of excitement about following this path. But it no doubt it is 10 miles wide and two inches deep at this point in a lot of fun. That's why the Hackathon Project is so exciting. And I'm excited that it's moving forward with Huntington because it's really the first county um, town uh, program that's really building fruit in this, in this initiative so far. But, I mean, you're definitely not wrong. And the reputation itself is a problem. Uh, I had the same problem my last effort in West Ohio, and I, I told the, the Community, I said, you know, one of the problems we're facing here is even if you solve all your problems tomorrow in terms of addressing the business community, the perception is still there. And it's going to take a lot of effort to change that perception. Even when you fix X, Y, and Z, that we maybe end up all agreeing to an issue, X, Y, and Z are going to be held against you for years. So there, there, there definitely are some, some obstacles to overcome. So, yeah. Could you just go back to that one with the two panels? Which one? Oh, well, no, it's the third yeah. down there. Not that's the most useful knowledge in the historical nature of the town, the dynamic factor in attracting people to the town. Again, I've looked at a lot of these, and I don't remember the specifics of these two communities. They've stayed in the presentation simply as an example of smaller communities that have had success, and in some cases, uh, more. Yeah, what do you think of this? I mean, here's my view from the years ago, the history of the town, but the reason that it's history is big. Plus, we should make, make use of I, in a lot of, for economic development in general, yes. I don't know how much of a role to play in an incubator, in itself, incubators, 
success in the incubator is to work out the funding and opportunities that are available for the startup to come out of it, what kind of support that they have when they go in. It. So I don't know if that particular um, factor has a huge impact on this one particular program, but overall it feeds the overall effort because it makes a, a community more attractive to yeah, live in. You said it was the appropriate to track the right kind of people and the people that want to come to the ones that are attracted to the right. Yeah, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, hold that thought because you're going to see that that's wrapped up. Like Brand's identity, which was identified as a producer. Right, right. I used to sit there showing historical values as a reason to go to work there. Well, tell you what, let's jump forward. Um, this is basically just talking about the fact that getting what you're talking about is we did just complete a brand for the Economic Development Initiative. That's going to give us the ability now to go ahead and get our website together, which hopefully we can afford the functionality of it, which I'm going to make sure we do get a property locator on it. We'll get a lot more social media. And most importantly, this is, this is the county in conjunction with whoever wishes to partner with us a lot. But I work for the county. So the county have a local brand and put together a website. We, the county, have come have hired a branded company to help us develop a brand just for this economic development initiative. Not a brand for the entire county, it's not a brand for Flemington, it is for this initiative. If we're having a project, for example, a funding community partnership like this year, there's going to be that branding and ours on there. In the future, one day down the line, you know, what would be great if all of us had uh, one brand to the community, to the world. Obviously, if that even is desirable, that's a long way off. So this initial thing is just about branding our reach out to the world and our initiative. I just want to clarify that because there's a lot of confusion about branding. You know, one thing has has had kind of their thoughts on branding, you know, for all the things they have. But you know, I'm glad to get the cameras. Absolutely, and the reason is that, you know, I'll just start that talk about the reason is that we're not we're losing a lot of opportunity because we're not marketing our strengths and, and assets to the world in any uh, under one brand, under one. So for example, I've spent a lot of time like Morris and Somerset counties is getting here. And it's stunning how many people have not heard of Hunter and County. But they've heard of Flemington. And they've heard of Lamberville. And they've heard of Clinton. But they have absolutely no idea that those guys are in the same county. And they have no idea that, that county is named Hunter. And so, and so, and that applies to all of our assets too. Somebody may come in and say, "No, Benedictine Vineyards," but they don't know that along the way they're passing bowling barriers to great places to stop. So what's happening is people are coming in, and they're coming in. They're, it's a one-off. They're coming to one place, and they're going, and they have no idea about what's around them. We want to be known for all of those things together, and that will make us all strong. So that's one reason why we're trying to go about this, this effort. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we, the, the, just to be clear about what we mean with brand, I mean, we know what our brand is. As a matter of fact, I jump forward, and our brand is this and a bunch of other stuff. You know, we've got these outstanding communities and a healthy lifestyle. You know, we're throwing public innovation in there. We've got an educated workforce and so on and so forth. We're not having them tell us what our strengths are. Uh, what we did was hire them to come up with a logo and a visual schematics and messaging architecture so that we can go ahead and have commonality to our websites and our social media and so on and so forth. That brand is done. Um, and actually, I did show it to, to Mayor Reiner at, when I rolled it out to the County Planning Committee recently. I'm not, because we're still nuancing it, I'm not showing it to you here tonight, but I do have an example of the way we're going to go, to go about doing this. This was a county that was in my general area in Ohio. And they had a lot of similarities to us uh, in terms of having a history, educated population, uh, a lot of active outdoor lifestyle they like to promote. They came up with an umbrella brand called Homegrown Great, and that was Miami County. And that was an umbrella that, uh, brand that gave them the ability to have a lot of sub brands under the same theme. So, looking at an example, here's their homegrown lifestyle campaign, or at least a piece of it, promoting all their active jogging paths. And obviously, we have a lot of this with river rafting and the balloon fest and so on and so forth. This is their innovation uh, 
uh, program. This is homegrown ideas. And so again, it's a sub-brand underneath the overarching brand. Here's homegrown history, and there's just a historical landmark. And here's homegrown goodness, which highlighted their artisan food and, and, and beverage uh, movement. So what we wanted to do is get a brand together that gives us the flexibility to promote all these assets. Again, our history, but also our innovators and, and so on and so forth. So that's what we've done. And jump into tourism, sir, to get to your point. Tourism supports that entire model in the way that you said exactly. And I won't waste time tonight going into the benefits of what tourism can do for a community. You know that. Um, but when we are marketing tourism, 100 and how many strengths of tourism to the world, um, we're marketing beautiful towns like this, and beautiful river towns. And we're marketing, uh, we're marketing that healthy, healthy lifestyle. And we're marketing the educated workforce, and we're marketing agritourism and that farm to table uh, that's so uh, important right now, and the uh, rich cultural and historical heritage of this community, so on and so forth. When we're marketing that to the world for tourism, we're also making a, a strong statement uh, to the workforce that we need to retain and attract that this is a great place to live. So a great tourism effort becomes a de facto workforce retention and attraction platform as well. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are communicating all those things because they do end up supporting the model. And yes, history absolutely plays a role in that. But it's part of what makes the community uh, distinct. So no question. The thing, one reason we haven't heard so much about tourism from this effort to this point, though, is because when this, that said structure had tourism as being one committee under my effort. And what I immediately said was that's unacceptable because me doing tourism 15% of my time through a committee of busy volunteers is just not going to do justice to what tourism can and should be for Hunter and County. That's not going to work. We need to come up with something more collaborative, county-wide, and sustainable. So I don't want to start that road that we don't finish now, and then we, it's just that much harder to get a team together. So what we've been looking at since then is what does that look like? And uh, there are efforts moving forward on that front. And once again, we're not doing it alone. We had an initial conversation on this with Delaware River Towns, which markets that area of the county, and the chamber. And we may be about to do an impact study and start to look at what this looks like. But there's a lot of folks that have stepped forward from towns and companies that said they want to be a part of this effort. Again, 10 miles wide, 2 inches deep, but we're committed to this concept. We're not going to have dot, 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 turtles in this county. We're going to make sure we, we go about it fully effectively. That said, there are a few little things that are moving forward. I'll just name one, and then I'll wrap up, uh, because it's another example of partnering with the community. We're looking at Milford, and uh, the nonprofit that operates the uh, tourism passenger rail, the Polar Vortex, Polar Express, and all those kind of things in Warren County and Eastern Pennsylvania, they have expressed an interest in having Milford as an end destination. Problem is, of course, that rail that comes in from Warren County into Milford has uh, been in disrepair for many years. Well, last year, uh, there was a little fundraising campaign about one mile red called the Milford Mile, and at the Milford Live Fest last year, they were able to bring in the uh, engine, and they were able to have a one-mile trip up and down. And the community was very galvanized by that. And we thought, you know, if one guy, which is what happened here, could raise enough money to, to fix one mile of the rail in about 10 weeks by himself, what could have concerted uh, a concentrated, collaborative fundraising effort uh, achieve? And one that starts to let the grants, et cetera. So we've been having initial meetings with Wilbur, the county, the rail, and some other folks about what that effort looks like. Because just imagine the train being able to run up and down the length of the river and uh, that kind of attention on Milford. Maybe one day getting to the point where folks that come in from Howard County have an end destination in Milford. The county's open space plan can bring trails up to uh, meet Milford. So those folks can maybe come in on their bike and then go spend money in French Town and so on and so forth. So there are a couple of tourism things being looked at where it makes sense and where an individual community wants to go down the road. But we're not going to have a quote unquote full-blown tourism effort until we figure out a way to do it justice. And um, I'll skip the rest of this because I know I've taken a lot of time here. What I will say is that anyone who wants to talk about any of these issues further, 
Uh, please do. I, I want to make sure that we're building this in and always build this in with, with as much input as possible. To be honest with you, there are so many smart and experienced people in Hunterman that if the county and our partners puts together a vehicle that engages people in the community as well and a structure that brings those ideas forward, the funding mechanism that uh, advances those initiatives, I could be a moron and still do this job. Uh, so I definitely want, that's not the goal, by the way, but nonetheless, um, that we do want to make sure we engage folks. So I will leave a few cards uh, on the end table here. I have no life. My cell number's on here. You may call at any time. You won't be interrupted. It doesn't exist yet. Remember, we're now in the planning uh, campaign. We are going to put out the RFP shortly to now we're going to look at the field the website will be. We're going to start working on that. I hope to have the economic on the website up by October at the latest. So. Mayor, do I have time to put out questions or just wrap up? Uh, what about an HST issue with the admin or so? You just tell me to shut up. Housing is the most vulnerable issue there is. 
You're not going to see me anytime here standing before you anytime soon telling you what kind of housing stock you should have. That's just, you know, not going to work. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you may not have the whole thing solved. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 yeah.
that has followed through. What are the actual results? What are the measurable results? And this is how we do things in Huntington. And there, I'm going to call on it. Okay, Robert, no problem. Let me uh, speak to your concerns. First of all, this is not a Huntington initiative. It's a county initiative. Is that your girl county? I know, but we're not responsible for their programs. So what we're doing is we're listening to their programs, see how we think we can fit into it. And if you want to uh, see how much broader those programs can be expanded, we can certainly have Mark come back to a future session. Well, so, but this was initially designed as a 15 to 20 minute program to introduce what they're doing in state. What I'm upset about is that I come to these meetings, I really almost been this um, and when I do come here, I'm investing my time, which may not be that much to you, but I have to my daughter, my wife, and my wife. And what I want to hear when I come to these meetings is what you folks are doing about creating an environment where my real estate investments are appreciated, where my quality of life is getting better, where my council is representing the people of Huntington. And every time I come here, I see just the opposite. And that's concerning to me. I want to know what you're going to do to make my taxes go down. I came here last time, I, and the time before that, and I expressed an idea, which I think is coming upon you to, to chase, because frankly, we pay a $6 million debt in this town. A $5 million budget, a $5.5 million now. And we have a, a lot of downward pressure on the commercial properties in this town, which is putting uh, upward pressure on the taxes for residents. And all I see is some high in the sky plan that is much more support site in Flemington. That's going to take 10 years to develop and have an impact on my taxes. I want the relief now. I want the appreciation now. So I can sell everything and go out of Flemington. So you don't have to cut up the anymore. Thank you. Who else would have a like comment? Paul Stewart. I wanted to uh, pass uh, number nine on the consent agenda, which is another way to find out uh, what's happening in the public house and how much I'm sponsoring it, and how much is it actually a share and how much is it going to be a share. Yes, yes, yes. The uh, item nine is about the funding house, which we are installing the new system of the uh, air and heating system. And doing that, we had everything we moved out of the building so it could be put back to the historic condition. So the new heating system already is being put in places where you won't even know it's there. And but doing this, we took out all the pipes. Every time you take the pipes out of the wall, you put them up with your pipe downstairs on a pipe or something. All the radiators are going to be So as this stuff is being removed, it's being repaired so that we can keep the right rail moving forward, well, not having to shut down the building. And that's where the uh, money is being spent. How much does that cost? It's, uh, we did a lot of the $15,000. And that's the other big department. There are tax payers, or is some of that cost going to be absorbed by the money? It would go against the capital, the capital ordinance that we've got adopted already. It's not a rich one. That, but it's but still, that's the capital. Yes, that's the capital. It's a month to month lease that either side can terminate uh, after your pleasure with 30 days notice. And who is uh, responsible for the any costs that are incurred? The oil, the lights, the whatever. Who pays all these costs? We have been paying the utilities there. And have you spoken to those people about absorbing some of that cost? Not about the utilities, no. We are uh, speaking to them about absorbing some other costs like insuring, getting insurance, things like that. That's needed to tighten up. Well, I just would ask that you also reduce 
some uh, you know, they could write some grant to do whatever, raise some money, they could have a GoFundMe or whatever they have on their all this kids are young, they can just raise some money and pay some of these bills. I mean, most of the things that they have are not uh, older citizen friendly. And and so I think that they should have some responsibility for some of the current costs. And I would ask them to look into that. Now the second one we need to move on for now. We'll, we'll come back. Well, I would ask that when you get to the regular agenda that you speak to items two and seven, because I do not think it's appropriate okay. for you to pass stuff without the public knowing what the okay. it's all about. No, sir, we'll, we'll, we'll get the regular agenda email. Who else has comments for now? Um, and, and, you know, just to clarify, the lease that's uh, being proposed does provide the tenants supposed to pay no hold up. You're right. That is a change. We have been paying for it. You are you are correct. And in this lease, in the, in this lease, they would pick it up. They will pick um, up I'm sorry. The, the utility. But we have been paying for it. Yes. But when does the lease start? Well, it, we're we're putting it in place now. What's the proposed plan? It's we're left them standing there. I don't care about the rent, but I do care about the costs. Okay. We need to move on. Joanne, you're on? Uh, Joanne Braun, 77 Jefferson Court, Wellington. Um, uh, asking the question, has the letter of the redevelopment agreement actually been signed? Uh, I believe so, yeah. It has been signed. Do you have the date? Um, uh, Peter, no. But it has been signed. Yeah. Also, um, I would like to know, how does the said I know they proposed development in here, a lot of it based on the sets. How is that job? The one I'm looking at it is about. I mean, the hotel area that you call it? Hotel area, yes. Well, the, uh, it, the sets program, or the sets study, identified uh, a need for rental units in the county, and it identified what everybody pretty much talks about anyway outside of cities about millennials desiring to live in urban areas with walkable space. So it fits in in that sense. It also fits in with the uh, bringing some higher education to the county. So the county does wholeheartedly support the project for the owners that endorse it their resolution. But instead, they talk about that people are
Parliament says, has any local government or local planning board out of the 26 municipalities, have any of them passed resolution accepting the county economic development strategy guidelines? I just heard that our um, freeholders have. This is interesting. If you're talking the county economic development strategy, like it was brought down from Mount Sinai, Jack Customs on the says committee, is that right? And I'm thinking also that Jim Robinson of Middlesex County, he was on the SEDS government committee, and I believe that's also right. And Chris Bailey, he was on the SEDS committee, right? So I'm for development, but aren't Jack Us, Council, and the Free Alders all telling the planet no one voted for? I believe in development. SEDS is a county plan with Flemington Borough as its ground zero. Flemington Borough should determine its own future. In scale, we're not a city, and we do not need to be told what to do by outsiders. We're just listening to their plans, not our plans, their plans. Who else has a comment? Uh, Richard Gibbon. Um, I know it's better that they agree with you to sign. Um, can, you, can you clarify whether that's the agreement that came forward or was it modified? Because I know a lot of us put suggestions. Now, if we were changing it, we would uh, on that. Okay, uh, we move on for now then to uh, Mayor Council reports. Okay, um, my report. For a long time, how many of the residents and visitors have eaten at Jack's Pizza at 55 Main Street? After 45 years in business, the owner, Salmino, had decided to put the design for sale, as indicated by the sign in the window. Nevertheless, April 21st of this year will mark 45 years in business for Jack's Pizza. And we have a resolution on our agenda uh, tonight. <laughs> We have a resolution on our agenda tonight to acknowledge your many years of service to the community. Please join me in extending the best wishes to Sal and the staff at Jack's. Um, on April 1st, last Saturday, I attended the, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, attended the uh, annual fire department ladies night at the Virgin Country Club. Um, again, we've been there for several years now. It was a nice event. We have even several decent names for the county council here, and I'm certainly not one of them. Anyway. <laughs> um, now, the admin committee met, uh, which is Mark Payne and uh, Kim Tilly and I, met with the office staff um, at their request uh, on April 3rd and also with Attorney Goodman to discuss and agree upon a procedure to deal with some of the complex voter requests. So, if the clerk leaves a request, it will take more than two hours to complete. We will now notify the requesting party that there will be a charge for any estimated clerk, other employee, or attorney time. Such time will be charged at the current hourly rate of clerk, other employee, and attorney. The requester will have the option to accept or decline the estimated charge. If they accept, they will be asked to pay one third of the estimated cost in advance. If they decline, the requested information would not be provided. This practice is within the auspices of the clerk under the open law to administer, and therefore it does not require a council resolution. That is why I am covering it now um, this way, just so that the information is made known. This would not affect the large majority of the open request, but it would affect a few of the ones that come in with pages and definitions and paid after paid and thought. Uh, last week, we will hold a public hearing on the 2017 budget later, <clears throat> later in the meeting, and I will provide an overview of the budget with some comments at that time rather than now. Uh, you can you start? Sure. So, I attended the March 28th Fire Officers meeting, and uh, the items of discussion were the drones, repairs to 5061, and the Hunter County Organized Training that will be held later on this year. Uh, the flower sale starts tomorrow and runs through Saturday or until they are sold out. If you don't need any flowers, please stop by and purchase a 
250 raffle ticket. Grand prize is 35% of the proceeds, and second prize is 15% of the proceeds. And our next meeting is April 25th. Um, the fire, uh, first aid and rescue squad their monthly meeting was held on Monday, April 3rd. This month, 20 members of the Phoenix American Rescue Squad will be headed off to Virginia to participate in the 2017 Rescue Challenge hosted by the Technical Rescue Association of Virginia. This annual event allows the members to work on some of the most complicated rescue situations imaginable. This trip will be the squad's third year of the challenge, and this event is not a competition, but rather a series of eight scenarios over four days that are uh, designed to test a team's skills and operational readiness. This year's challenges will be in the Virginia Beach area after the last two years when the Roanoke Valley. To view the 2016 challenge YouTube video, please see their Facebook page, and their next meeting will be on May 1st. On the school front, April 23rd is the Public American School District's 5K color run at 9 a.m. for your shine. There are volunteer positions available. If you know someone or if you or yourself are interested, please contact Jennifer Hill at jbh241.com. There isn't anything on the OEM. And as the mayor stated on the admin, currently met on April 4th to discuss the open policy. Uh, request. We would also like to really provide more information on the website to possibly alleviate some of these open requests. Um, finance, we're just looking at the budget. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a fundraiser Saturday, April 22nd, at TJ Fridays in Flemington for our 2018 short and long track Olympic hopeful can you get. From 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., 20% of your food bill will be donated back to Help Kimmy as she needs late skin suits and is hoping to be able to go to Korea this summer for training. At 8 p.m., the band receptors will be playing. And just please make sure if you do attend to mention Kimmy Getz or there's a flyer posted online to just show that to me tomorrow morning. That's all I have. As far as my community, uh, you already heard that we do have a lease for them, it's ready. And we're asking for certain items that they normally have not paid for to this point. Um, I'm also asking that they come to at least one council meeting a month to tell us about the events they're having. I really feel strongly that any group that is getting a facility rent free owes us that. And what they're doing there should be on the record. Um, <clears throat> Also, we've asked that they let us know so when a sign goes up, you know what it means. Because a title of an event doesn't exactly tell you what the event is always about. Beautification, we're having a cleanup April 29th, Saturday. And we're meeting at 8 a.m. in the morning. And at noon, there'll be a free lunch for all the volunteers at the DPW. Uh, we're providing everything you need, as well as a free neon green t-shirt that day. So you'll get gloves, trash bags, water bottles, whatever you need. And DPW will be assisting in the cleanup. Um, HPC, their website is almost complete. And I'd like to say that Richard Giffen has taken over their Facebook page. He will be the administrator for that. So I'm looking forward to reading some of his posts. And I know he just went to a very educational workshop at Rutgers, I believe, right? About historical preservation. And um, he took fabulous notes on that. Maybe you can post some of those. Um, Funny Castle, uh, they do have a set of new bylaws that have just been introduced to their board. And uh, Mr. Goodman and the mayor will also be reviewing those. I'm very hopeful that we can come to an agreement with those. And they do have a lot of upcoming events. I know I've been talking about them for at least a month now, but the first one coming up is the porch dedication. And the steps were slightly damaged during the um, repairs, but they're, they're easily fixed. And that's going to be taken care of before the April 27th dedication. We have uh, fifth graders visiting the week of May 15th, followed by that weekend on May 20th, we're doing a colonial chocolate presentation, and uh, Candy Corral will also be uh, providing many samples of chocolates in this century. Um, <clears throat> June 10th, they have a colonial music 
afternoon planned, and then later that evening, they're having a specialist come to make historical drinks that would have been served during that time period, and they're also going to have tavern food. And I hope you're all aware that all of these events are free to the public, and they're really fabulous, fabulous family events as well. They're looking into creating a teaching herb garden, and um, it'll have culinary herbs as well as medicinal. So that will be great for our fifth graders to see. And that's really all I have. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Okay, well, this is not too good here. But uh, what happens to these meetings does take a lot of time. Uh, we meet several times to, to go over the uh, word meter situation and new meters are being installed. Out of over 1,200 meters, I think we're down to about 20 left to go. Most of them are due to the fact that they're not occupied, uh, they're owned by the banks, so they're not living here, so it's kind of more difficult. Those will be shut off, and then if the men are sold, the people that buy them are going to have to deal with getting them to turn back on. Uh, but going about as far as we can go, we have a few more if we want to finish up here. Sure. They've done a pretty good job pretty fast. Uh, was a comment made by somebody about why aren't we doing this work? I mean, well, we do that many meters, and along with all the work that we do, you know, we can do one or two a day. It takes a year of um, the money that we send online, all being handled by the electronically, so we know exactly if there's a work being going on, and we can monitor it. Uh, we had a funny career recreation meeting last night. Our plans are being made for the summer. We actually started talking about next fall for uh, ski trips and things like that. Um, and the uh, July 3rd fireworks, uh, Mark probably would have made a comment that he wasn't here to talk about it. That's still on schedule, it'll be the fifth to some complaints on the third. Um, our DPDW meetings, we've met a couple times. Uh, we meet early in the morning and uh, the men have started doing cleanup work. Uh, they're going around picking up their leaves and branches and things like that as we put them out now. Uh, planning on the summer to be in the mowing, uh, but we take care of uh, it's, You know, I can sit here, I hear the grass growing right now with the meat and the water down. Um, also, uh, I attended the fireman's ball and, uh, and I was actually one of the ones that danced, so I had to sit down. Uh, <laughs> We had a walk, and it was a lot of fun. And they always do have a, a nice turnout for that. Uh, in fact, I think my wife won 50 50 and gave all that. But we got to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I also attended the, uh, no, then I just like to say to everybody, have a happy Easter and enjoy the week. Thank you. Okay, since John Michael is a little bit
futures contract and work on that, we're going to have to work on that. And uh, so we're going to work to launch that final product. And then uh, other than that, just the explore form of brand um, has been launched and uh, so we're moving forward with that. And so it's been really cool. The next few weeks, there's some really cool stuff going on there. Um, and also 
of the uh, doors, I don't know if anybody's been in the library recently, but the doors are very heavy, they're very hard to open. Um, Sean's been having to go and chop them up, and you know, it's at the point where he could be breaking his, his, his finger doing that. So we, we really need to replace the doors, prepare them numerous times, and it's just, they, they need to be replaced. So Sean got um, three estimates, even though it was under the threshold, we still went out to get uh, three estimates. They range between um, $3,700 and $5,400. Um, I'll review that with the library committee and Ron Martucci, but um, that is something that we really need to, need to address. So we'll, we'll go forward with that. Um, also with the current cap, I've been working with uh, some of the seniors there. Uh, Penrose is uh, proposing a 17% to 23% rent increase over there. Um, we can set that up to be 55 plus senior housing. Um, and I was, I mean, you know, there could even be a story here because Penrose has been uh, very secretive. Uh, the residents there are required to get a big package that gets presented to the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Authority. The management there gave out packages to the residents that were incomplete. So I had to intervene along with the residents to get the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Authority to send the package that they were given by Penrose and get financial information in there. So there's something going on there that's just not, not quite right. So um, Jack Chiarelli's office is looking into it. Um, I wrote a letter to the um, director of the finance authority, um, and there's we need to review the application for this grant for the So it's just, you know, I want, I want people to be aware that I think the seniors at uh, Herman Cap are taking advantage of by the um, by the man. Sorry, we yeah. didn't, I didn't want to have to speak up, but I'm not sorry. Okay. Uh, so I heard, I heard a comment when um, you always said taxes, and we want their rents going up. That probably is going to be a fixed tax structure that they pay. So um, that's not the that's not the reason. It's also designated as,
2017 regular council meeting minutes. Second. Yeah. Roll call, please. That was John and Mark. Yeah. And Brian. Uh, Brian. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mr. Brennan? Yes. Mr. Williams? Abstain. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Wingle? Yes. Mr. Tilly? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have 10 items on our consent agenda. So Motion, please, to adopt the consent agenda. I'll second. Brian Kim, roll call, please. Yeah, we're, we're already doing 
going to be more numbers. We've already been working for it. It's very uncomfortable. What is the work to replace these servers? Yeah, sewer, water, rain, and structure. So we're replacing all the lines. So then it's going down. Yeah, we move all the places. Is it replacing the same location or is it going to be next to it? Same thing. So it's removing the old one for you and Mac panels as well? Actually, I'm not exactly sure that it might be next, like the water might be next to it because we can't just you know, cut off the water and keep it going and then it starts back to get the new main and then we switch them over one by one. Right, so you have to refer in here and speak to very specifics of like how exactly it's going to be on, but it's that basically what we're doing. Okay, I'll move it. Okay. Moved by Brian, seconded by Roll call, please, on number 86. Mr. Foreman? Yes. Mr. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Pierce? Yes. Mr. Swinkle? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, now we uh, come to our budget. The first item is resolution number 87, and that is to authorize the municipal budget for the year 2017 to be read by its title. And I believe this simply means that since we have adequately posted the budget after introducing it, a couple of weeks back, that we do not have to read through every line of the budget to introduce it in the title. Um, so that is what, how we do, we do it. So was there any discussion about this particular? This is not the budget itself. This is just letting us get to the budget. So uh, if we have a motion, please, on the resolution. Thank you. Okay, so now we come to the budget. Um, we will open the public hearing in a moment. I thought first I will provide some highlights of the budget. So you know what it is you are um, we're voting on and uh, you will have for the budget for the next year. Um, as in the past, council met several times, five to be exact, to review each department's budget uh, and their requests for programs this year. Uh, these cover every expense item in the budget, and when those meetings were finished, we then held a couple more meetings to put it all together and get to the bottom line with significant help from our CFO, Bill Hans, who is over here to my right. The total appropriations for this budget are $5,527,336. Which is $58,000 or 1.08% more than 2016. This continues a trend since 2009, wherein the total budget is growing by an average of 1% a year. In fact, it's up 8% in eight years. The municipal tax rate increases by 1.8 cents. By comparison, last year's increase was 3.4 cents. The rate increase amounts to $47 a year on an average home value at $259,900. By comparison, last year's increase was $87 on an average home value at $256,000. Our surplus at the end of 2016 was $448,000 and change. For reference, this is a good story. For reference, since 2000, our surplus reached its highest ever at 2005, in 2005 at $2.1 million. It declined steadily thereafter and on nearly evaporated two years ago, it was down to just $31,000 at the end of 2014. So in the last two years, it has recovered $448,000. I have recommended to the council that $500,000 be viewed as a reasonable target surplus for our $5.5 million budget. That would mean, if we exceed that level, we would apply any access either to reducing the tax levy or to our capital reserves, which could in turn be used to fund projects without as much borrowing. I can say 
this would be the first time in my time in local government that we would actually have a target surplus level and a plan to manage accordingly when we uh, reach it or exceed it. Let's turn to debt for a moment. The net debt in our general budget was $6.1 million at the end of 2016. Our debt has declined in each of the last two years and is over $1 million less than it was at the end of 2014. The state allows the municipality to manage its debt at or below 3.5% of property valuation. We have traditionally been at or below one half of that amount, and we are currently at 1.31% with this budget compared to the end of the year. So, the budget includes a 2% salary wage increase. The four largest expenditures total $3.0 million and account for 55% of the budget. They are the police department at $1 million $301,000, then insurance and social security at $620,000, then debt service at $574,000, which is roughly in line with what it's been, you know, significant up or down on that one. And pension contributions are $545,000. We are contributing $75,000 to our capital reserve fund in addition to that, we are buying one police vehicle and one DPW vehicle with current debt, and we are contributing $18,000 for an ambulance for EMT service as in previous years. So I think I can speak to the council. We think this is a good news story. Uh, there are some increase, but our debt is coming down. Our surplus is going up. fairly stable, sustainable situation with that general budget. Uh, while we're not voting on these, and I don't know if you want to part of the uh, package that we're voting on, but just so you know, the, uh, in the sewer department, we will plan on a $25 annual increase that would take effect probably in August. This was current ordinance that was adopted last year and that is to cover wet weather facility repairs. And we expect there would be no increase this year in the world. So, with those introductory remarks, uh, I'll ask for a motion to open the public hearing on the budget. I'm sorry. Okay. And after the public hearing, we'll have for discussion on council. Okay, uh, roll call, please, Sally, to open the public hearing. Gordon? Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Public hearing is now open for any questions or comments about the budget. We have our expert Bill Hans here, our CFO. Uh, Would you like to ask him about Stewart? Oh, Stewart. Okay. Uh, the the it's a cute report Um, we have a 2% increase uh, in the salary wages other than, except for the, well, the uh, PPW and Teamster contract, I, I'm sorry, PPA and Teamster contracts are still to be finalized, but they are being finalized within um, amounts that we have approved for and uh, worked out with the CEO. Yes, but I would like to know what percent. Well, they haven't been presented yet. Um, the total amount, you can look it up in the budget, the total amount of salary and wage lines increased $70,000 for the sewer and current. That equates to a total of 3% increase. But that includes overtime and all that. So it doesn't mean that's what we're selling the contract. That's not negotiated at that point. We've allowed for that. We've allowed for that. That's what we're talking about. Well, I, I have concern because of the unions know that you have 3% of your budget that was to recruit them from fighting for the 3%. Right. Right. First, since I'm um, involved in negotiations, what I would say to them is, is that um, 
my my became business insurance by that I was on the PDA contract then. Um, me and Rito Rackers so where we stopped having attorneys battle over contracts with each other. We negotiate in good faith face to face with our employees, as you would in any other employment situation if you're a lawyer. So if we're doing the same thing, we're broken iron negotiating directly with the, the team from our office, uh, from that union, and, um, and we're, we're working at it. We're, we're working our way through numbers. We're getting closer to the we're not there yet. Um, obviously, yes, it's public information, what we have done here, what we have available. Um, but it's also, too, about fair compensation for our employees to make sure that we're offering competitive salary that we can maintain and retain employees, and that they feel like they're, you know, they're appropriately um, compensated for the work that they're doing. So, so we're, we're working on it. We're going to have to find one number again, and we do, we'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> With all due respect, I mean, we've been asking these guys to take zeros and ones for a long time. And that, over time, that creates a passing weight, weight right, where you have all the municipalities paying way higher than we are. You do run into the actual people paying people. So we have to make sure we run into the That's all I want to say about it. Perhaps the municipalities that you're referring to have a higher average. Yeah, they probably do, but that doesn't change the equation. But still, Brian, you have to recognize that.
upgrading the sleep of the that is it's just a normal rotation. Frankly, no one buys Cadillac and race cars. I mean, you basically get offered either, you know, through the two companies, Ford and Chevy, really make them. You really get offered, like, this is cool. this is our police car option, and that's it. It's not like you get, like, all the packing is on. It's a good, small amount of people you can add on, but for the most part, we take pretty much the old police cars right from the company. So the only change in that budget then is the increase in the salary. Total to this budget, we're down to $28,250. Salary, and we have no expenses. Okay. And where are we paying for the credit card? The cards are included in the business model. It's built in to the budget. We're not, we're not, we're not bonding for it or borrowing money for it. Same with the sewer department. They have a pretty good fleet in the sewer department, too. And um, so we're we're buying one new truck there without having to borrow any money. How much are we doing? Eighteen thousand a year. We've been doing that how many years? Uh, three, three years. Yes. Robert. So we have I thought it was nine hundred to three hundred and fifty or something surplus in the super and the order but we still increase the water tax by like 25 hours. No, sewer. Sorry, sewer tax. The thing is, if you have a 900,000 dollar service, you're charging 25 dollars a month for It just to me seems reprehensible that you're charging customers 25 dollars more when you have a, a service of 900,000. That just doesn't make sense to me. And I think there was an increase in the water tax. No, not last year. Right. Last year, not this year. Oh, we had a surplus again. We had a surplus again. So, small towns are going to be, it seems to me it's kind of funny that your municipality owned utility, and utility should be the net zero, save some, you know, surplus because of, uh, you know, understanding, hopefully. But I, I have a problem with that. You know, I think you guys should all think about it. As far as the local government is still living, Bro, you mentioned that you felt that Penn Road's property was taking advantage of its residents. That's what I heard. Did I hear you correctly? Um, they have not been sharing the information. They gave them incomplete um, submission documents. They're required to submit their budget to the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Financing Authority for permission to raise their rents. Um, they were um, set up to do uh, uh, have low income housing units. This isn't part of the budget here, though. Oh, it's not part of the budget here, yes. Just a point. Any other questions or comments about the budget? Steve. Um, I'm looking at the planning uh, board, but one out of the year. And I see uh, there, are two, there are two pieces here. Uh, one of the salaries and wages and one of the other pieces. Salaries and wages, I presume, are Eileen's um, generation. Yeah, Eileen Marks, yes. Yeah, so yeah, the Secretary, 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 and then I got another issue with that. The 53,150, I noticed that there's uh, 4217, 53,150, 4216, 53,150, same number. Um, back in the next planning board meeting, uh, and I think, can you explain to me what that, um, what, what, is, what is included in that, that 53,000? Because it's other expenses. It's uh, all the professionals, I mean, that's the department. Okay, so that would be the, the attorney, the engineer, the lawyer, anything else? Well, this for this for our website. So I pulled the out for this work. That leaves me 41, some, some fifth grade math here. So 41,000 is for legal, professional, engineer, and professional planner for the year. Okay. And any office supplies, which is and training and costs, okay, home bills, whatever. Okay. So, uh, 
that seems uh, like a nice conservative number, nice, you know, not spend a lot of money number. Um, but at the last night board meeting, there was a uh, carte blanche given to uh, to McManus to do a study on the um, additional redevelopment space uh, with basically an open end kind of check. Um, and I'm guessing, just even if I do some, some again, some stupid fifth grade math, only give her $5,000 to do that study. That needs to be the $36,000, which is now attorney's fees, planning fees, federal engineer. You also indicated, uh, Phil, that you, there was money built into the budget for doing that study not to worry about where the money is coming from. Now I notice that there's no difference between 2016 and 2017. And I also presume you had some number in mind when you made that remark. Can you reconcile this for me, please? Well, when we do the, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers there, Steve, but when we do the planning board budget, one of the big uh, the biggest variable is what you think your professional services are going to be because the secretaries, so those, most of those things are pretty cut and dry. The big variation is always around what you think your professional services fees are going to be. And um, I've been doing that budget for a number of years and um, we do that at pretty much at a macro level now. We have a history of what the expenses are. Uh, we go back and we say, well, we did these projects last year. We know we got these projects coming this year. We know roughly, I don't have it on the top of my head right now, but we know, we know roughly what the study costs to do here and need to do and something like that. So, uh, and we know what we've got coming up or not in the way of COA and we estimate that, and, and frankly, we do it at an aggregate level. We don't put it in that it's exactly this much for this study, exactly that much, because it, we just don't know that much. So but that would be unreasonable. Yeah, so, so in this case, this year, we knew, and we knew where the redevelopment project was headed, at least we anticipated where it was headed, and we knew yeah, those were your exact words. Yeah, there would be, there would be the uh, study to expand the area, there would be the uh, revision of the plan, and then there would be the site plan application. Uh, we also have a redeveloper agreement that uh, the redeveloper would be paying for most of the uh, professional services that go with the project, so um, that's how I was comfortable saying that yes, of course, we plan for this. this. What was that number? What number? Dollars. How many dollars? I, I don't remember which one it was. Now, how many dollars do you think it was going to cost to reevaluate this this plan? I don't. I don't remember. Um, no, as I, no, I, no, my, my main point was that I didn't even we didn't even look at it as uh, this much for this project, this much for that project, this much for the other one. We looked at it at an aggregate level and tried to cover it. Has Mr. Cuss put any money in escrow? Yes. To do this? Yes, he had, uh, he put uh, $15,000 into an initial escrow account about a year ago, I think it was in March. Uh, that was drawn down and he's replenished it. So, so what's, it, what's, yes. it, what's, what's, in, what's in that account now? Uh, it was replenished and had about a $2,500 bill pending, so... Maybe it's true beyond the budget. Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm trying to understand this $53,000 with my great So now, Barry, you're quite wrong. There was $13,000 left over last year's We also figured all the lag might be factored in there. So, so how much is in that? How much is the cost of that? How much is the cost of that? 
meanwhile, the, the developer agreement says he uh, he will keep that fifteen thousand. When it gets down to five thousand, he'll replenish it. My my question is, how much is there now? Because I don't see it, frankly. It's a uh, 
it's a key level of safety, public safety. Uh, and uh, that's just my thing uh, at this point. Can I just respond to you with all of that? First off, yeah, sure. first off, you know, I kind of hear you. It's literally charged. You know, what goes very well about this is she's the one who spoke the last time. Um, but my thoughts are that these are assumptions that you are making. And that, A, there could be an, an analysis done of what this, you know, outsourcing. I'm not saying Murphy, you hear me say Murphy. I think it's just hire them to do it, hire someone else to do it. Um, and I think the savings are being significant. Um, I think there's a lot of assumptions that you're making which are not really um, fair to make. And to use that politically charged um, excuse is kind of a topic. You know, because frankly, what really matters here is, you know, are we getting a level of service? Or can we get a level of service? How can we get insured to get the level of service if we did outsource this? And what would it cost? Not that we could just have a conversation with every township and let them give us some a proposal for it. And let's, let's start looking at the numbers. There's no harm in doing that. And it's, you know, there is harm. There is harm. When you start, when you start something like that, um, there, is, there is harm in doing it. If you need to do it, then you have to do it. Thing, but to just voluntarily go and open up that can of worms, I don't think would be a smart move for us at this point. And I agree, I acknowledge it's my opinion, but I don't see that much savings uh, unless you just cut service. I mean, if you just want to cut the number of officers in half, yeah, there's big savings to that, but I don't, uh, I don't hear the community, uh, I don't hear anyone saying that. Except you.
walk the streets of my community, know those police officers, not all of them certainly, but there is a level of comfort that I think most people enjoy, at least those that I've spoken with. I certainly don't talk to everyone, and there are people out there who are not happy with that. But frankly, I am glad that we have the police force we do. The men are uh, absolutely passionate about uh, their work, as it can be so as that I've spoken with. And I think they take great pride in protecting our community everywhere they do. It would be detrimental, A, of open up this conversation again, I believe, not only for the police force, but for the entire community thrown into the turmoil over uh, a topic that we have beaten that for prior years. And I think if we have learned from that, then we need to take a look at that again. And we ought to be learning from that. This would not be a benefit to the borough of London in any way that I can see. I'm glad to be able to pay their salaries. I don't like high taxes either, but I'm very privileged to be able to pay them and have the services that they can provide. So they need my backing, they have it. Thank, Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, I'm not an elected official to the part of the council. Okay. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Budget? Richard right, Gibson? Okay. No, we do not have any particular plan built in for that in the budget because we don't know the time frame. However, I mean, the, uh, as I said in some past meetings, Richard, the, we have, the citizens have been asking us from time to time about why don't we get on with it and sell that property in, in, in any of it, even before the, um, the Gus plan came onto the, uh, over the horizon. And in any scenario like that, we would have to be able to relocate the police. Part of it, would be funded by not having to pay the building anymore. We are still paying off that building, so um, we would be relieved of our debt payments for the building, which could be applied toward something else. But it's rent free right now, so we have Well, it, well it's, it's a semantic term. We're, we're paying off the building, so we are paying every year for that, and if we sold the building, of course, it's about 500. No, we have a total, I think, of about 540,000 dollars left to pay on the building. Nine years left. Nine years, nine years left to pay off about three and a half million. Fifty grand a year, roughly. Roughly. Yes, it's worth what? I'm just thinking the idea that you can make a profit on the sale and then you can use that to buy the sale. That's how I can do it. Yeah. It's the part of the sale. Have we ever had a look at the location in mind for where we're going to put the police soon? Not yet. I would ask that the owner of the field, I mean, of Spring and Court, I just love where they are. Okay, uh, yeah, we're still on the uh, budget public hearing. Are there any other questions or comments about the budget? Yeah, has some um, uh, new has been hired to do a, uh, a study to the extent of the development area? She was authorized by the planning board to proceed. And proceed with a full study. For a full study. I thought it was to determine if those buildings need to be criteria for those buildings. Well, that's essentially what the study is. That, that, no, that's the essence of the study, is to say, do these, do these additional properties meet the criteria and therefore should the board recommend or not that the, the area be expanded? And how did you authorize for the study on that? As I was saying, we did not have, we did not do the budget study by study by study because things always come and go. We do it in an aggregate 
kind of at the high level from experience, what do we think we need based on what we got coming this year and what we spent in the past? It's probably one of the most difficult, if you were going to really try to do one, it's probably one of the most difficult in the entire municipal budget to do is that one right there because you don't really know exactly what, what's going to come your way. Okay, let me give you an easier question. Maybe go over here so quickly. How much money do you spend on attorney fees for Bethlehem and then for Goodman over and above his work, Goodman's work here at the council? Over and above. Well, how much is the attorney slush fund that we have that we spend it? We don't have a slush fund. How much of the budget was what, 130 or 140 for last year? It was 145 last year, it's 135 this year. Yeah. And that's that's solely for what? Legal fees. Is it legal for him to be here at every week? It's 140000 No, 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 no. no. Far, Far from it. Far from it. It's it's uh, it includes the labor attorney. It includes redevelopment. It includes real estate. It includes tax appeals. It includes uh, the, the work that had to be done for uh, with the uh, Department of Environmental Protection related to the gas station sale. And everything that comes our way. Everything that comes our way. Um,
So that's what the sword has done us in the office of the moment. I think I'm going to We have a motion to open the public hearing. Is there a second? Yes. Okay, we have a second. Roll call for the open the public hearing, please. Mr. Yes. Okay, here it's open and the question is. Okay. So the way it's handled now in front of years is that they they can install them themselves and they're going to have to calibrate every so often. A lot of times it doesn't happen. And um, so we don't have the level of oversight and control that we should have in order to be able to ensure that the product we're selling is either correctly. And so therefore this change needs to happen so that we're handling all of the Any other questions for the public? Yeah, the state also has uh, strict regulations on how much, you know, we got to account for our order, you know, order loss, and uh, this will help us to uh, find, identify uh, order that we have not been able to identify because there's been a lot of meters that, you know, aren't actually going to be So this should help out. Thank so you. Without this change, you have to go to the house and we need to read go to the building. You're not a popular 
stabilization, this would be a net zero. I can see having having a reserve on the side, but you can't. But you can't have a net zero going into this. You have more of these of eating fish. They have emergencies. We need that money for such a situation. Three hundred thousand is not a really big number for a department that we're running, and you have to be able. To, and we might use it for a well to repair a well. We have to be doing some wells. It may help us not to go out and borrow money to do these projects. That's why I said I'm fine with the capital reserve even having a little emergency reserve. But, you know, it's, you're increasing the rate. No, no. Well, the surcharge, uh, last year around how much? $40? $40. Oh. So, yeah. Well, it also went like 10 years without raising the rate. It should have been doing $5 a year or something. So it would have been one large thing. Why? Why? Because, because and because we have nothing, that's why we got to borrow a half a million. If the model you know, was being done in your county for capital reserve and emergency repairs, you would have because cost factors always increase. You know, I'm not sure what you know about it. Exactly, I'm exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I've been your principal. Frankly, it is, it, if, we, if, it, if it shows up in next year's budget, it will not be much of a difference. One more hour, but I get the principal. All right. Is there anything else, uh, any other comments about this ordinance? Okay, see it done. Motion to close the public hearing, please. A second. All right, it's one and done. <coughs> we'll call, please, to close the public hearing. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Foreman? Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion on council about this ordinance? Okay. The motion to adopt the ordinance. Motion to adopt the ordinance. Okay. Okay. Brian Brooke, motor call to adopt the ordinance. Mr. Gorman? Yes. Ms. Nicholas? Yes. Ms. Peterson? Yes. Ms. Wingo? Yes. Ms. Hill? Yes. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to our second public comment session. Um, we're at 10 o'clock, so uh, are still on. Anybody have any further comments? Lois? Lois, you're at 96 Spring Street. Yes, I would like to know. Someone told me that recently on a DIY or whatever it's called, that there was a uh, lunch on Black Lives Matter and the borough had SWAT team come. Is that correct? No, the borough incurs an overtime expense. Um, to the tune of about, I think it was roughly $3,400. Uh, the county and the state police also incurred some expenses for that. That's there was concern in the law enforcement community about that. But that's a tremendous amount of money. It certainly is, and now we are getting a lease, and it uh, is partly in response to a series of events that emanated from that. It was, it was not acceptable to us to have something like that get presented to us for which we had to pay. We felt we had to pay some money. Well, I'm, I'm very upset that it cost me that much money. I think people can come to this town and talk without having to have a swap in there. It wasn't a swap. Okay, I would like to, I want to make sure that you all know that we are going to take you. This is what I'm going to talk with them from. That lovely, lovely thing from the marriage house is going to be destroyed. And I would like the shade tree, the roots of the eggs on the shade tree, to uh, be in contact with the chamber and see how we can get a nice tree replanted on the front of that property. I will address that to them. The highest property, what is the status? Because I guess we're going to have the filling station again, but we're going to sell it. We are, we are moving to sell it. And for uh, an option. Uh, we've been looking for a realtor to uh, market the building and sell it in a conventional fashion. Um, the one request we got back, as I said, was for an option to pay 10% fee. Uh, we got back to them um, and asked them if they would reconsider something more in line than a conventional um, real estate broker fee, 5-6%. Like 
feedback back to us and said no, that he, he wanted to do um, he wanted to do the 10%. And I, I, I should have talked about this in my report. I had it on the notes, but um, and, and you know we talk about it in public comments, but I will next time. Um, if we want to consider that to be a responsive bid or we bid, he did get back to us and say that he felt it was responsive, um, Gary. So I don't know if there's any legalities about us rebidding it if he did come back to us and say, well, I think my original bid was fair. I didn't read the original RFP that went out. It allowed an auction, and I don't know that it did allow for an auction in it. That was an option that was included. Um, it was not an option that was, was we pointed out, but it wasn't an option that we right. said that we did not. So then it was not a response to bid if that was not an option. Well, we didn't put it out directly because we want our piece to market it and, and do it, and it was our understanding that this would be a conventional real estate broker. He came back in and said, no, but I can market it. It's going to be 10% and I'm going to do it as an option. Okay. I'm sorry to take the time. We did, um, we'll be looking up. So, Parker, her partner, the Who has not spoken? If anyone still wants to speak, all right, we'll go. We'll go one more round. This is my first time speaking. Go ahead, Robert. So I'm on my property. I looked at that property. There's a 25 foot set, setback on each street. It's on the corner. You have 10 foot setback off the side of the rear line, off the road. So you have an area of developments like 59 feet. And unless you want to use that building for something, which really doesn't matter, I suggest you just this problem. Just put that out there. And if you're going to offer any concessions, you have to sell this property around changing the FAR and, you know, and the sideline requirements. That will impact the value of it. Because it will be developed at that time. So, um, yeah, actually, putting it in an area you could be developing would be race ball patch if you wanted to do that. Um, I heard a broker, and I'm not going to ask her, but I heard a broker say earlier that you know, she feels that the Penrose Property Company is taking advantage of the tenants over there. I heard Swingle say that there's a high There's calcium in Swingle, Robert. Please, theoretically, um, that it's a pilot program. What is the pilot program now? Sorry, what? What is the pilot program? I couldn't speak. I just know that it is a pilot. That's all. Okay, so you right. also stay. So what I'm saying is that in my three minutes, I will speak. So the way it goes, Brian, is you stated that it had nothing to do with taxes. How do you not know, or how do you know that the, the pilot program didn't uh, provide for the tax increase at the county for 15 years, or however many years been there? They're paying 37000 a year, 34000 a year to flat. How many years? Okay. And my last question is when I'm funding the firm. Is that um, often under contract with the Cust uh, Development Group? He, he, yes, Jack Cust has some contract agreement with him. Okay, and that is included in the area uh, for study condition, study condition area.
tell you exactly, you know, I can't tell you right now what happened. If you want me to call you up, I'll tell you exactly what they are. And not what happens. Well, I don't know who they are, where they started, how much. Well, I don't know where they started. I can tell you the total. I can tell you right now the total amount of the exemptions for that, the abatements, is about 1% of our values across the line. Well, it, it's project by project. It's once once the tax assessor approves it, then it's five years I believe they have. And the ones that are in effect now uh, are about one percent of our tax base in aggregate. There's a half a dozen. I just don't have them. But I do that. Okay. All right. Uh, Richard, you get the nine million to slip right into our council swingle. So at the um, last meeting, a few of us raised concerns about the union and about the um, waterproofing. I think uh, Brian, you, you promised to go and get some quotes for uh, yeah, the building. The building official I had that chance to be locked off. I was saying, I'm willing to I was down the flu for like over a week, so I had no chance. Yeah, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I get a vote for him now? No, I'll talk about it. What's my wife and I have? Because it was my kid. If you want to go ask a question, you can certainly do that. But my, if you want if you want the answer, the official answer for the public, then I'm going to have to talk to you and see what's going on. So I'm going to have to talk to you. What I'm saying to you is that I haven't had a chance to because I was down in the floor. And I'll get a chance. I'll go meet you and get a chance to talk to you about it. Okay. Uh, I think we'll move on. Move on, we have an attorney to the board, Barry. Yeah, let me have to everybody on the uh, lawsuits that have been brought uh, by the Friends of Historic Planning and uh, because one of them has uh, been completely wrapped up. Um, two of them are uh, still ongoing, uh, but I think it's uh, important to uh, uh, update everybody on them. The one that now is uh, completed is the lawsuit that uh, was brought challenging various aspects of uh, uh, the designation of uh, uh, the area being a redevelopment of the union like that. Um, if you recall, the, the lawsuit initially claimed that um, the uh, votes were invalid at first because there were people who could not get into our old wall that were standing out the whole way because of uh, the large crack. Um, uh, so they said that that invalidated the vote. Second count, and it said that um, because the next meeting we heard that there was going to be a big crowd, and quickly tried to shift the meeting here um, from Borough Hall so as to be able to accommodate everybody. And they challenged that because they said there was an inadequate notice of the shift to be able to accommodate all the people. Um, those two counts were dismissed early on um, in the lawsuit. Um, they then challenged it on a legal ground, saying that it violated the local redevelopment housing law, that was dismissed early on. Um, they also said that uh, they amended the complaint to say that um, uh, the borough uh, improperly had not consulted the CHIPO, which was just factually wrong, that was dismissed on the lawsuit. The only count that was left remaining in that lawsuit as a result of all the other counts being dismissed along the way because they were just was the count that uh, Ed Patrick was allowed to speak for more than three minutes, and the attorney for Friends of the Burr Clinton was limited to speaking twice three minutes each, but he claimed that there was discrimination and violation of Section 1983 federal law um, because she got to speak for more than three minutes at that one meeting. Um, that count is now been dismissed, I'll say voluntarily, um, they dismissed it, um, and, uh, uh, but they did it um, without prejudice so that they could bring it again. We had notified them that we thought that, that was a frivolous count, as did as we thought about the other count was frivolous too. We are reserved our right to, um, uh, to go forward and uh, seek attorney's fees because we felt that it was frivolous. If they try to refile the complaint as to the appropriate you know, issue, for so long. So that complaint challenging the uh, designation of an area of development has been totally dismissed.
both of those requests are pages long. Um, all the documents have been um, provided and uh, we requested that they dismiss the lawsuit and wait for an answer on that. More recently, they filed a second local lawsuit um, about a um, November 2016 local request that they uh, had problems with uh, response. Um, all those documents have been provided to once again uh, one of those voluminous request pages, something like 25 type requests, 25 requests, you know, separate requests. Um, all those documents have been provided. We sent them once again a frivolous lit uh, litigation letter saying that you know all the documents have been provided. And in fact, if you remember the last time I reported on this, I was I had no idea why the lawsuit had been filed because we had provided all the agreement, all the documents before the lawsuit was filed, which is why we sent them to a frivolous litigation. But had any filed a lawsuit, when we provided all the documents, and the two attorneys, Bob Beckelman, was handling this, and there were emails, all the documents have been provided, and then literally, a little less than a week later, this lawsuit got filed. So, you know, now, waiting to hear from them whether or not they will dismiss this lawsuit, um, the total lawsuit, and we reserve our right to point to see attorneys in the That's the status of the three lawsuits that they filed. And how much is this on process? I don't have I don't have a total. Um, uh, I don't keep a running total, but I can right. probably so January it was about it was about fifteen thousand and I did not get February bill, but I got it. I, yeah. I just got it and I don't know uh, so it's um um, uh, the older lawsuits, I believe, were uh, just friends of historical Cunningtons in the caption. The redevelopment lawsuit was friends of uh, historic Cunnington, uh, Gary Shopping, and the old school. Uh, that's the one that's now in total. Okay. Anything else? <coughs> Yes. Yes. Thank you. Is there any other matter? 